Okay. It says that we're live, but my uh, other screen says we'll begin soon still. I'm seeing the attendees rolling in now. Okay, connecting. Mm -hmm. Okay, welcome everyone. Oops, got to turn off my sound over there. Welcome everyone to the first uh, of a lecture series, Ferro Lectures on ferroelectrics and related materials. We started this because of the pandemic and the fact that we're not all seeing each other like we normally do at many meetings during the year. And we just had a um, successful uh, virtual meeting in, um, uh, beginning of February, beginning of February, but it's a long time till next year, and and uh, there's many people that have a lot of interesting and important things to say and a lot of interests. Uh, we have several, uh, 250 or more uh, uh, registrants for this uh, lecture, so it looks like there's a need out there for this. This is sponsored. This series is sponsored by the Carnegie Institution for Science and the Earth and Planets Laboratory of the Carnegie Institution and co-sponsored by the Center for Materials by Design, which runs the Ferroelectrics Workshop each year. Uh, this is a picture of our, uh, of our laboratory in the spring and the fall, uh, which uh, most of us are working from home, so we're not seeing the cherry blossoms right now. But uh, maybe they're done. But uh, anyway, but you can see a picture of them. Well, we're really excited about our first speaker. Oops. Uh, who's Emmanuel uh, Defay from uh, Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology. And he's going to talk today about from voltage driven phase transitions towards electrocaloric devices. And uh, he's uh, done a lot of interesting work. He's started it in electrical engineering and then got a PhD in uh, Lyon and has spent uh, 15 years uh, with Grenoble and it was at uh, ca uh, Cambridge uh, studying with uh, Neil Matur and has this interesting paper with uh, Volker Heine and others and, and Neil on uh, electric calorics and mag magnetic calorics. And I think that's probably the, the best title I've seen of a, uh, of a uh, perspectives piece on uh, physics. Too cool to work. But he's not too cool to work as he's going to show us today. Uh, he's done a lot of really exciting stuff on piezoelectrics and electric calorics. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to him so you can Go ahead and share your screen, uh, Emmanuel. All right. So it should be this screen. Let me make you the spotlight. Is it working? Yes, uh, it, it is. All right. Shall I start? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, great. So thank you uh, very much, Ronald, for, for the, the kind introduction. Well, I have to, to acknowledge uh, Neil uh, for, for the title, uh, Too Cool to Work comes from, from Neil. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very happy to, uh, to be a, a speaker of the day um, on these uh, Ferro Lecture, Ferro Lectures. Um, yeah, thanks uh, again for, for uh, the, uh, I thank the organizers for, for, uh, for this invitation. So uh, Ronald, uh, Jorge uh, and Laurent. Um, I also, so today I will, I will then uh, talk about electrocaric devices, electrocaric materials. Um, I will then use the pointer, yes. Um, I also I talk uh, uh, on behalf of my colleagues, uh, Alvar, Yuri, Pierre and Veronica, so working uh, my, my closest uh, collaborators uh, on this work. Uh, and uh, here I will um, uh, talk obviously about material science or ferroelectric materials. Uh, but also there'll be uh, there'll be parts dedicated to thermodynamics, something we have to do when when it comes to uh, to caloric materials and, and devices, uh, but also uh, on, on engineering. So I, I hope you you enjoy it. Um, so uh, um, here I will. Uh, can you can you see it properly? I can't see everything, but should be fine. Um, then the, the the plan of my my uh, my talk. So I will uh, uh, explain uh, what the electrocaric uh, means. Uh, the electrocaric effect is, I'm not sure I have a perfect view here. OK. 
okay. Sorry, I put to stop. Look, fine. Okay, perfect. Put it here. Sorry about that. Okay, so then I will I will uh, I will mention the free energy. So a, a very simple um, uh, um, theory uh, part on this, but I think it's pretty powerful. So I wanted to to mention it. Uh, I will uh, talk about three different electrochloric materials, focusing mostly on uh, two of them, uh, on ceramics. Uh, I will stress the interest of phase transition in electrochlorics. So that's something which is true for all chloric materials. Uh, I will also talk about an amazing uh, structure for uh, electrochloric uh, devices, which is called multi-layer capacitors that are essentially capaci capacitors that we use in, in every uh, single um, electronic apparatus. But here that we, 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 we use a bespoke ones, uh, thanks to the collaboration we have with Murata. Uh, and uh, I will then talk about cooling system, which is something uh, specific we do here in, in Luxembourg. Um, and I will also, if I have time, hopefully uh, mention also the stress, the, uh, the importance of efficiency uh, when it comes to, uh, to devices and to real applications. All right, uh, electrochloric effects. So I try to find uh, the simplest way to, to explain it. So here we are dealing with dielectric materials. Um, so this is insulators meaning that we can apply a field and we can charge them. So that's essentially a capacitor. So here, uh, imagine that you have a, a, the simplest capacitor you can imagine, and you look at its temperature. So there are different ways to observe its temperature. We apply uh, uh, at some point a, a, a voltage to this capacitor. Imagine we apply it very quickly, because if we can see an effect, so we want to see it um, in its, let's say, adiabatic uh, behavior. Uh, so we apply this field very quickly. And in red, we observe the temperature of these materials. So that's, that's possible. I, I, I will explain how we do it. Uh, so you can see in good electrochloric materials then a steep variation of temperature, most of the time a positive increase in temperature. And if you keep the voltage on here, and if you let uh, the, the capacitor um, giving away uh, its uh, calories, its, its heat, then you go back to uh, the initial temperature still filled on. And when you release the field, then you have the opposite effect here uh, that then uh, if you are in, in a good condition, so you can see that uh, this is uh, symmetrical. This is something we try to do in, in devices as well. And then you go back to, to, to the, uh, the initial temperature. So this is a transient effect contrary to, to the Peltier effect. Uh, and if we want to use this effect uh, in, a, in a device, we need to use cycles. So that's why we need thermodynamic cycles to, um, to, uh, to use it. Uh, I was mentioning uh, uh, of, of this variation of temperature. So uh, there are different ways of observing this, uh, this variation of temperature. Uh, one of the neatest ways probably uh, using an infrared camera. Uh, so here to represent it, so uh, um, this is a, a piece of material seen from this infrared camera from the top. So this is a, a pellet this way, which is 0.5 millimeter in height, one centimeter in diameter. So a, a microscopic object that you can hold in your hands. Uh, we are going to apply 700 volts on it and then observe it with infrared camera. So the, this comes from uh, from Ukjo, uh, from Unist in Korea. And I will run the video if it works, hopefully yes. So we have a red shot and then a blue shot. So representing obviously uh, then increase in temperature. So uh, remember the first slide, so I play it again. And then the cold shot that are essentially uh, the same, but opposite uh, with respect to the, to the temperature. Uh, and um, you have then a delta T of basically three degrees close to room temperature on, on this uh, lead scandium tantalate material. I should have, I should have mentioned it, this. Uh, First, so that's a material I will going to, to, to speak a lot about. Uh, and um, so that's one of the best ways to, to observe these uh, electrochloric effects. Another possibility is rather than looking at the variation of temperature is to look at the variation of entropy. To do it, one of the best ways is probably calorimetry and even differential scanning calorimetry when you compare with a sample that doesn't experience any phase change or any uh, entropy change. Um, other than the one related to the change in temperature, because you 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 can change the temperature, uh, but in this case, so we are doing it at a steady temperature. Uh, that's why we call it isothermal heat or entropy um, measurement. And in this case, um, you oh sorry, I've been distracted. Um, here, what we do is we we do the same. So we apply an electric field, 
to change the, the let's say the, the condition or to charge the, the, the capacitor made of uh, the electrochloric material. And we are going to induce a variation of heat that we can measure with this DSC, so differential scanning calorimetry. So in here, I mean, what is kind of wrong in this graph is that we don't apply the field very quickly, uh, the other way around. So we try to, to, to keep a, a temperature which is constant, but we want to get access to the whole variation of entropy, uh, uh, which is then uh, the, the heat released by the material divided by temperature. So the two best ways to, to observe probably the electrochloric effect. All right, uh, now I come to the, to the free energy uh, simple analysis I was mentioning. So here I will try to, um, uh, to use the, the simplest one. So um, where I, I will start with um, the, the Gibbs energy here, uh, where I take then the, the quadratic term uh, with um, then the, the, the coefficient in front of p squared that uh, depends on temperature. So as simple as possible. So the, the, the standard one that gives uh, the opportunity normally to, to see the curve I slow uh, in the parametric phase, then just uh, the p square uh, term and then uh, minus EP because we want to apply an electric field. So here uh, polarization P, temperature T, so Gibbs energy G, the electric field obviously E, uh, and then uh, the entropy S. So why do I mention entropy? Because here if we can deduce the, the, the entropy change from uh, the derivative of G with respect to T at constant P, which makes something extremely simple. So we have A P squared. Uh, that, that means that the variation of entropy we can induce in the material when we apply a field is uh, A times, well, minus uh, half A times the difference of the square of the polarization. So right from this um, simple equation, we can already deduce things. And I, I wanted to show it today because I think uh, uh, it works extremely well with PST, let's scandium tantalate. So uh, if we want then to, to, to get as much uh, entropy variation as, as we, we want, so we need small a and, oh, sorry, big A, oh, it's, a it's a mistake. Sorry about that. Uh, we want, uh, you'll see why I made the mistake. So we want to have A as big as possible and large variation of, of, uh, of the polarization. So um, if we take the, the, the part related to the variation of polarization, so we want this, del we saw that delta S uh, is proportional to the, the variation of the squares of, of the polarization. So uh, on a ferroelectric material, so it means that if we have then this, uh, this curve, so the variation of P will be between P max and P min. P max is high, but P min is small. Well, I mean, the difference, sorry, is small. So meaning that the difference in the square is not going to be as large as we, we would hope to, to be. Uh, in a paraelectric material, so it can be better because we always go back to, the, to, to zero, close to zero in terms of polarization, but most of the time, so it decreases very much uh, as long as we increase the temperature compared to TC. So if we are very close to TC, it can be of interest. Antiferro and relaxos are uh, probably more interesting because we somehow ensure that we go back to, um, to a polarization which is, um, which is close to zero. And we can ensure that we have a large polarization when the, the high field is applied. But there's something even more interesting that uh, well, we didn't realize initially. Well, it sounds obvious, but uh, I, have to, I mean, to be honest, so we, we, we haven't realized this is that um, in materials such as PST, which are not anti electric materials, you can induce the phase transition by, by using the electric field. So how does it work? So uh, here I display uh, um, curves, PE loops that, that were collected on the same uh, kind of material I showed before, the one I showed the video, uh, where you can see then the behavior of, the, of the, the PE loops with respect to temperature. So we apply the field here, we measure the polarization, and then we go uh, clearly from, and we increase the temperature. So between uh, black, red, blue, and then uh, green when we increase temperature on, on a, a temperature span, which is not that large. Um, so here, the, 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 we start from a, a purely ferroelectric phase, uh, in, in black, the red is also ferroelectric. Then we see this kind of weird shape that looks very much like a non-ferroelectric material, which is actually a phase transition. So we induce the ferroelectric phase into the material. And then if we go too high in a temperature, uh, which is not too, I mean, very high, but still, so a, a bit more than, than 310 degrees uh, Kelvin, we then uh, are in the paraelectric phase. So 
the, the interesting thing here is that we simultaneously measured the temperature change induced by the electrocardic um, effect, which is represented here with infrared camera. And you can see that we can make a direct relationship between the P-loop and then this, uh, this change in temperature. So the black ferrule two phase uh, is represented here at 88 uh, Kelvin. The uh, electrocardic effect is pretty low, like 0.3.4. The same with the red loop. You see that the maximum happens with this blue loop here uh, that looks anti-ferroelectric. So this very large variation of polarization that I was mentioning in the, in the, in the Gibbs uh, free energy. And then when we reach then the paraelectric phase, so we go back to something which is uh, much less. So we have here a direct observation of what um, uh, Landau theory or the free energy um, uh, extension uh, was or already uh, foreseeing. Um, if we want to go a bit further, so le let's try to, um, to see, sorry, again, so that's not small a, it's, it's big a. Uh, so the, the second parameter that appeared into the, um, into the variation of, um, of entropy. Uh, so how can we somehow figure out what this a means? Uh, so if we then take over this, um, this G uh, equation here of free energy, so at equilibrium, uh, it's zero for uh, dg over dp. Uh, then meaning that we can have an expression of E here. Um, and if we derive a, again, so a second time a G uh, versus P, so we have a, a representation of the director constant. So this one, which is, which is um, much easier to, to figure out uh, experimentally. And this one is then, uh, we have also the, the A parameter appearing here. So if we were to, to first get rid or, or don't consider the second term, so it means that uh, the higher A the lower the dielectric constant, which means that what we want to have uh, for a large variation of entropy, if we were to have a, imagine a material when we have similar variation of the square of, uh, of um, polarization, we need large A, meaning a small dielectric constant, which is somehow counterintuitive because you want a material with large variation of polarization but a small dielectric constant. And uh, we can't say that ferroelectric materials are famous for the low dielectric constant. So um, how does it look like in, uh, on, a, on a real material? Um, so PST is, a, as I mentioned, a, a very interesting material for this because we can change uh, somehow its, um, without changing its composition, but in, in changing its order, uh, the way the atoms are, 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 are uh, positioned on the B site, so the regularity of, of the, the, the scandium and tantalum uh, atoms uh, can change it, its order or its ordering. And this changes then the, the, the properties, uh, meaning that here, so that's this order parameter, order parameter. So I will, I will mention it a, a, a bit later, more precisely, but we can, uh, this graph is not, is not great. But what I wanted to show on this graph is that the direct constant that uh, is measured on PST samples, uh, bulk samples here, is inversely proportional to the, the, the adiabatic delta T that, that you can observe. And the variation is substantial because when you are at, let's say, a pretty low order parameter, so you have 0.5 as delta T, whereas you can reach values that are here um, a bit more than two, it, this is substantial, whereas we see the other way around in terms of dielectric constant. So to be more, more accurate and trying to, to, to make the parallel with the, the, um, the free energy expansion I showed, uh, so here um, I'm uh, displaying the PE loops of the disordered and the ordered um, material where they are uh, the largest. So you can see that the, the maximum polarization is nearly as large uh, in the disordered um, case than in the ordered case. And we have also a, a, a minimum polarization, which is also nearly the same in the, in the disordered, it's still in the favor of ordered, but somehow similar. Whereas if you look, at the, the measurements we perform on, uh, uh, on the dielectric constant. So here, the variation is massively uh, inversed compared to what we somehow could have figured out without uh, thinking too much. Uh, well, that's the way I was thinking was going to, to, to work initially. So in the disorder, so we have a much higher dielectric constant than the in, the in the ordered case. So which completely confirm what we observe with this very simple uh, Landau theory that uh, large P and small dielectric constant favor than the electrocardic effect. Uh, a very last point on, on the Gibbs uh, energy. Um, 
where we can also uh, figure out the isothermal ent entropy change, uh, which is probably the most simple um, expression for, uh, uh, for um, uh, or somehow to have a, a physical um, uh, impression of, of what electrochloric effect is. Uh, so let me try to put it in equations. So if you take, uh, if you are at, at constant temperature, so the, the variation of entropy is only the one that you would induce with the, the electric field. So we, we get rid of any other uh, you know, stimulus. Uh, and we would like to have an expression of ds over de, which is a bit more, uh, I mean, self talking, if I, if I may say. Um, so then we go back to, to, uh, uh, to basic uh, thermodynamic expressions where we use here um, Gibbs energy which is also a, 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 the, the um, properties of total differentials, uh, meaning that the cross derivatives are equal, meaning that ds over de, so ds over de is the same as dd over dt. And this dd over dt, so in, in those materials, we always consider that d, so the electrical displacement is very similar to p polarization. So there's always a kind of ambiguity uh, between p loops and d loops. Uh, but for this, uh, for this discussion, I think it's, it's very similar. Uh, so meaning that if we can figure out PE loops at different temperature, and if we were to compare those values or the slope uh, for a given E, so or a given electric field, so we have already a very good, um, let's say, um, sense of how uh, large the entropy can be. So because we can come up with this uh, expression of DS that uh, when integrated gives uh, simply the, uh, the integral of uh, these, um, these variations, so dd over dt at constant e times de, obviously. So meaning that here there are, let's say, two ways where we can improve as much as possible this ds, this delta s. So having a large variation of uh, electrical displacement or polarization with temperature, but also trying to, to, um, to apply a field which is as large as possible which then uh, enables increasing further uh, this, this variation. So this term is also, well, I mean, this, this over expression is very important because it means that we can also uh, uh, find configuration when we can apply much uh, larger electric fields, so typically thin fins compared to um, bulk. Um, so uh, bottom line in here is that the variation of D or P versus uh, temperature matters a lot. It has to be as large as possible and applying large electric fields matters as well. Uh, now, um, the, the, uh, the, the materials themselves. So I, I talked already a lot on, on lead scandium tantalate and I will keep on talking about this material because that's the one we studied the most uh, at least. Uh, why? Because that's probably the best uh, electrochloric material or electrochloric ceramic materials because there are, there are some now competitors, uh, in particular uh, polymers. Uh, but also uh, this material has uh, its phase transition close to room temperature, which make, makes it very handy to, to work with. Uh, the second one is lead zirconate, so another uh, perovskite material uh, that has a very peculiar uh, negative electrochloric effect uh, that is also um, well explained by phase transition. So um, uh, I will also uh, talk briefly about it. So we had a bit of... Uh, uh, work uh, in collaboration with, with uh, Gustav Catalan on this. And uh, then finally, um, PVDF, so uh, polyvinylidene difluoride, uh, which is an alternative to ceramics. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I will show just one, um, one slide on this uh, work that uh, had been done in the US, so not, not in this, but very interesting. Um, so uh, lead uh, scandium tantalate. So it's a pair of sky, AB of three. Um, I, I mentioned already the, the importance of, of the ordering into the material, so which is the regular alternance of scandium and tantalum on, on B site that we can see here. So um, a scandium in, uh, in green and tantalum in um, orange here. So if you have a perfect uh, al uh, altern alternance of uh, these uh, uh, atoms, so you are in the ordered case, so meaning that you have a first order phase transition, very strong one, and when it's disordered, so you are in the ferroitric uh, relaxor. So um, I, I just remind then the, the, what we saw the, the slide before uh, that delta S is then the, 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 the integral of uh, dd over dt times dE. And we can already from uh, then the, the, the variation of polarization, so a, a paper from Navasetter from the, the uh, 1980, uh, where uh, she could see the, 
here the slope of polarization versus temperature, you can see that the ordered one uh, exhibit a much steeper uh, variation, so this dd over dt, which then explains also to some extent uh, through this, this uh, simple equation of uh, variation of entropy that we have a chance if we are in, in the right temperature region to observe a very large electrocardiogram effect. All right, uh, another way of, of seeing this first order phase transition is uh, to, to do calorimetry on, the, uh, on, on materials. So here again on, on PST bulk. Uh, and then a way of expressing it is that there's a latent heat uh, at the transition, which is the definition of first order um, material. And uh, this one also, uh, some measurements that we perform here, um, at least, uh, you can change uh, the temperature at which the peak occurs. So uh, meaning that the temperature at which you, you observe a, uh, a phase transition. And uh, which here, uh, basic, so you can see that these different curves uh, have been then, uh, or let's say the phase transition has been triggered by increasing the temperature, but we applied a constant electric field during all these me measurements. So that's what we call uh, ISO field measurements. And you can see that then uh, the, the, the transition uh, goes towards higher temperature uh, as long as the field increases, which makes sense because it means that the field stabilize the ferroelectric phase. So that's why we are pushing it towards a uh, higher temperature. So to give numbers, um, so the, the, the latent heat is basically 1000 joule per, per, per Kelvin. Delta S, the variation of entropy is basically three joule per kilograms and per Kelvin. And the delta T adiabatic is basically 3.7 Kelvin when we push very hard on, on PSD, just to give numbers, which remains still uh, well not uh, as large as we would like to, to be, but that's uh, probably one of the best, uh, again, uh, material. Uh, another way of seeing the, this phase transition, so I mentioned it here on, on the entropy change because it is very interesting to see it for, for devices, as I will uh, mention afterwards. So I, I then represent uh, the, the entropy of PST with respect to temperature uh, when the field is off and when the field is on. So you, you can see, so that's exactly what I was expressing before that we, we push uh, further away in temperature, the transition, which somehow open this kind of area that we are going to take advantage of. How? In making a cycle uh, in this region. Why? Because we have then larger variation of temperature and then of entropy if we cycle here than if we cycle in this small area here. So just to, to, to uh, explain a bit the way we, we are making uh, devices or cycling in devices. So we start at a given temperature, field off. Uh, we are here uh, simulating to, to some extent what we call a Brayton cycle, where we start with a, a isentropic or, or adiabatic step, so applying an electric field as fast as we can. So we reach then the, the red curve here. Then we let the heat uh, goes away. Remember the very first slide. Uh, but not down to, the, to this first temperature. So we want to keep it at, at, at the given temperature. And then we release the electric field. So go back to field off, so the black curve. And then finally uh, go back to the, to, to the initial um, point and then we can carry on cycle. If we work in the reversible phase transition, which I mean here, I, I just remove here uh, something which is, can be very annoying for cycles. So this is something where it's not, uh, and we, there's a thermal hysteresis here and here. Uh, but we can find ways, uh, especially on, on, on multi-layer capacitors that I will mention afterwards, uh, ways to, to get rid of these uh, hysteresis. But you can already see that it's much better to work in this area than working in this area, meaning that phase transition is definitely something of interest for electroporic uh, material and, and devices. Um, now, a, a material which is a bit more complicated to, um, uh, to explain, um, which is the, uh, uh, then the, the lead uh, zirconate, which is also a perovskite material. And so, uh, as I mentioned uh, in introduction, so this material uh, is, is interesting because it, it exhibits a positive and a negative uh, electrocardiogram effect 20 degrees apart, basically. So it's a higher in temperature. So here I, I expressed it in, in um, degrees Celsius. So it's around 220 degrees. And we can see that we have first a negative effect and then afterwards at a bit higher in temperature, a positive effect and they are substantial. So you can see that here it's close to six degrees for the positive one and here close to four degrees or minus four degrees for the negative one. 
So what's going on here? Um, so we can see that uh, there's a peculiar uh, sequence of, um, of phases. Uh, when we are here, so the first phase we have here is anti-ferroelectric, as we can see from the P-loop. Then we reach a, a region where uh, we have a, a stable ferroelectric phase, uh, contrary to what, what we observed uh, before on PST, where we don't have any, any stable anti-ferroelectric phase just the, 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 the field that induces this phase. And here, uh, when we are in this uh, area, so we didn't represent it, but we reach obviously the paraelectric phase. So to try to understand a bit better and to confirm that the, the phase transition is actually key to explain this, uh, we run uh, DSC, so calorimetry to observe this. And then we observed indeed that we have uh, uh, two peaks, uh, I mean, a bit more difficult to observe when we, when we come from, from heating. So where we have anti phase first, then ferroelectric phase, uh, and then the paraelectric phase. So here again, so we we are we made um, isofield measurements. So uh, by by yeah, applying different fields uh, uh, during the, the the thermal cycling here uh, in the DSC. And then when we cool down, so we see the same. So uh, two uh, here exothermic peaks when when we cool down. So why do we have this this negative effect and then uh, positive effect? Is that actually what happens that we always go towards ferroelectric. So meaning that when we start from the uh, anti-ferroelectric phase, we apply the field, we go to ferro. When we are in the paraelectric phase, we apply the field, we go to ferro. And then you can see that it goes um, in the, I mean, the other way around, uh, comparing the two, the two situations in, in temperature, meaning that the normal way, uh, the, the way we, we saw in, um, in uh, PSD, so let's canyon tantalate, is this way, so that, that leads to a, a positive electrocorrect effect. Whereas when we go somehow uh, induce a, as if we were increasing in temperature from anti ferro to ferro, so we induced in this, uh, this negative effect, which is here expressed. Uh, so we are as if we were heating. So we go from anti ferro to ferro. If you want to go here, so you need to pass this peak here, with, which is endothermic. So you have to cool down. And then the other round, when you go from paraelectric. Uh, to ferroelectric, you have to, to pass these, these mountains here, meaning that you have to go through uh, an uh, a exothermic peak that induces then the, the positive electrocardic effect. So very interesting, uh, uh, let's say, uh, effect of those phase transition in, uh, in PZO. And a substantial effect, probably more difficult to use in applications because we are uh, here dealing with uh, temperatures that are, that are much higher. Uh, another important um, um, effect of the phase transition um, that um, is expressed uh, best, I think, uh, through uh, multilayer capacitors. So those are th this kind of multilayer that I will mention later. I will explain a bit more. Uh, but essentially, this is a, a combination of thin films or of films that are much thinner than bulk, uh, even that they, they, they can be in the tens of micron in thickness. Uh, but they, they enable to apply much larger field than what we have in bulk. And they remain uh, macroscopic uh, devices, which is extremely interesting uh, to make devices. So here I report on a, a study that was performed in Cambridge uh, by uh, Bassiner uh, in, uh, in uh, Javier Moya and Neil Matthews teams, uh, where they, they uh, and, and on devices that were made by Murata. So the one that I will also mention because we worked on, on those, uh, we are still working on those uh, devices. And then uh, we can see that there are uh, somehow two effects uh, on the electrocardic um, effect or, or behavior. So here are, uh, we have the, the, the variation of temperature observed by infrared camera or indirectly. I haven't mentioned on the indirect method because I don't have time, but you can see that this is essentially the same. Uh, and then uh, in red, so this is when you apply the field and in blue, when you remove the field. So that also shows a, a nice way of, of uh, a nice expression of, of um, symmetry uh, in, in this uh, applying and removing the field, which is important as I mentioned. But you can see essentially two slopes. So first a very steep one, and then something which is not as steep, which is then the two, uh, the two main effects that we can observe in, in those materials. So the phase transition itself that then induce uh, the, the, the phase to go from uh, um, paraelectric to ferroelectric. Uh, and then something which is more gradual, you can see that if you want to get access to basically the same amount of delta T, so going from here to there, you need much more electric field. So basically uh, six times or seven times more than the one you needed to trigger 
the initial part, but then it's very substantial. And this is what we call the supercritical regime. And that makes those devices uh, peculiar and, and very interesting because you can have much more uh, variation of temperature uh, when it comes uh, to, to, to devices. So, and then in this paper, they, they mentioned that uh, they could reach a 5.5 degrees at maximum in the PST uh, uh, arranged in this uh, MLC configuration. So talking about the, the, the shape of electrochloric materials, so, I mean, I essentially you mentioned everything in here. Uh, so bulk is, uh, well, electrodes on top and bottom. So you have uh, a lot of active materials. So that's the main interest of bulk, but you can't apply very large electric field compared to thin film where you can apply uh, most of the time, at least one of the magnitude more. But as I mentioned, so we have this uh, extremely interesting structure of MLCs. So where is, there, there's a special way of, of um, assembling all these and preparing these. Um, well mastered by, by several manufacturers in the world, but especially Murata, uh, who um, uh, accepted to, to, to try to use a specific bespoke materials into there and then PST. And that gives us the opportunity to uh, then play uh, with, with, this, uh, with these great uh, devices. So this is interesting. I repeat what I said before. It's a macroscopic object compared to thin film. So we can really uh, exchange heat uh, efficiently. Uh, we can apply large field uh, and then use this great uh, supercritical regime. And also on the top of that, so inner metal electrodes uh, increase the effective thermal conductivity, which is a bit more subtle to, to observe, but this is uh, another, another set of this uh, structure. And this is then the best samples for electrocaloric uh, prototypes. So another uh, nice feature of these, as I mentioned, is that uh, here I compare bulk PST. So that's the Delta T uh, observed with infrared camera. So on both cases for bulk and for MLCs made of PST. Uh, so you can see that here we apply 10 kilovolt per centimeter and here we apply 12 times more. So that, that's make it very, very specific and peculiar. And you can see that the, we have access here to a much higher variation of temperature that can reach uh, three degrees here, whereas here it's two point something. Uh, and the most interesting uh, feature I mean, once the, we can compare the delta T is that we have something which is uh, much broader in temperature. So you see that here from 25 to at least 50 degrees. So we have the same variation of temperature, whereas on bulk, we don't have these. So making a, devices, a device with this uh, bulk PST is much more uh, complicated. So MLCs are great. So now I, I will uh, uh, talk about the, the devices the, the themselves. So what do we need to, to build a cooler? Uh, we need a cooling mechanism, so we are going to use the, the electrochloric effect, obviously, <clears throat> um, so that I, I already extensively spoke about, a hot side and a cold side, so to make then a, a thermal machine as, uh, as we all alert. So that's purely a thermodynamic, so I won't go through the details. I'm nearly running out of time. Uh, what here we focused uh, on is the temperature span. Why? Because whatever we do on those machines, if we want to, 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 to build something convincing, we need first to get a large delta T. And even if 5.5 degrees is great, it's not enough for a real device because for air conditioning, so you need at least 15, 20 degrees of temperature span. And for a fridge, it's 60 degrees. So five degrees, definitely not enough. Uh, so how can we do this? So there's a, a, a trick in, um, in a thermodynamic, which is called regeneration. Uh, where uh, the idea is to try to uh, somehow separate the heat from what part or uh, create a, um, a thermal gradient, which, which is probably easier to, to say. So to do this, we need a porous structure. Here, uh, an example on um, magnetocaric materials where it can be plates, uh, roads, uh, powder, uh, but in our case, so we have to apply a field. So we, we, we need plates, as I will show. Uh, we have to displace a fluid back and forth through the porous structure. And we have to synchronize this fluid movement with the, the EC activation and deactivation. So here, this is a, a, a finite element modeling of, um, of a device where you have here the EC plates. We try to, to do it as simply as possible. So that's the, the initial point here. So when it's, it's uh, green, we have a cold side here, a hot side. But I mean, eventually, because, we, because of the synchronization. And you can see that little by little, we accumulate cold in the left hand side and red, so meaning a uh, hot uh, heat, like it may say, on the right hand side. Uh, and this is exactly what we are going to do uh, with real devices. Because here we can increase further 
uh, with respect to the initial uh, intrinsic uh, delta t. So what we, we start working on initially were uh, kind of bulky things. So here you can see the, the, the great MLCs that I was mentioning before. So this is in collaboration with, with Murata again. Uh, so we try different things with uh, nylon frames and big things made of plexiglass uh, to, to, yeah, to, to cover all these. And when we started uh, with this, so we saw that we could only get 1K of variation for 2.2K uh, in the material. So obviously it's not good. And the, the modeling told us that we have to decrease the plate thickness to increase, so this thickness here, to increase the heat exchange. We have to increase the plate length to try to, to uh, secure a large um, variation or, or gradient of temperature. And we have to make a very substantial effort in insulation on the frames, the diffusers, the holders, and the surroundings. Uh, and this is what we did. Uh, so we started on these plates here, uh, so the MLCs that were arranged, so a lot of DIY with double side tape spacers, silver paste, etc. Uh, we had to seal all these, connect to fluid tubes, tubes, um, and here to make it even longer than what we have here, so basically four times longer than what we have. And uh, this is what we had, so starting from, from the MLCs, uh, so, we, we, so the same MLCs that, as I mentioned, so the one that uh, Bassi in Cambridge uh, characterized, uh, we could only rely on here a variation that was a bit more than two degrees um, because we wanted to, to ensure uh, reliability. So it was limited to 700 degrees at maximum or 600 degrees, so around a bit more than two degrees. And we could uh, eventually um, observe these, uh, uh, these um, performance on our prototype. So we start here, uh, so here we cycled. And then we started to apply the field uh, only, only here. And you can see that we have the hot side and the cold side. Remember the, 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 the animation uh, that we had on, on simulation. And then you see the gradient uh, building up here and reaching 13 degrees, which is, which is the water cut, uh, something we, we published last year. And we'll show a small video if it want to work. So just to, it's not exactly the, this experiment that we showed, but that also, uh, that we observe with infra infrared camera when you see that you have the delta T building up little by little, so the hot side here and the cold side. Uh, obviously, we had to insulate, so we couldn't see it where with, with, uh, with thermocouple, but well, that shows it. Another interesting feature I wanted to show you, uh, published uh, last year from a US team, uh, they did something uh, somehow similar, but without the fluid and with another material, so meaning there's room for also a, a technology, different technology. So it's not just a one single mainstream. And here they, they were using um, uh, then display that can go uh, up and down. So with several stages here uh, where they could build up a, a Delta T nearly as large and what, uh, as what we had. So nine, nine K uh, at, at room temperature. And I, I encourage you to, to look at the video they, they produced in, um, uh, on the internet so that you can get access uh, with, with the paper, which is really uh, stunning. Um, then the key parameters um, for, uh, for uh, doing devices, then large adiabatic temperature change, as I said, um, high energy efficiency. So I, I, I haven't uh, mentioned it uh, yet. So that's what I, I want to do in a, well, a few minutes. Uh, and then heat exchange that uh, I, I will not um, uh, discuss today. So efficiency matters a lot. Why? Because uh, so that's the, the vapor compression. So this is what we are using today uh, in, our, in our kitchen. So uh, the fridges are based on vapor compression. There's a limitation uh, in terms of efficiency. There are a few um, technologies that could push it further and uh, electrocalorics are one of them. Uh, even if we were, I mean, if we, if we could have 10%, so that would be just fantastic. Uh, and why electrocalorics specifically? Because we are playing with capacitors meaning that if we do it this way, we can um, recycle uh, somehow the energy that makes uh, a, a big difference eventually, that could make a difference eventually. Uh, so um, we, we worked um, in the intro, in intro so um, Ronald mentioned that we, we, we published uh, uh, something uh, on, on the, um, these two cool to work. So that this is essentially coming from, from these uh, material efficiencies that we, we, we materials efficiency that we came up with, which is extremely simple. So that's the heat you can uh, trigger with the work needed to trigger this heat. So, and this one is nice because it's kind of universal. You can do it on every correct materials you can think of. So here you can integrate uh, EDD from the P loops and then look at the variation of, of, um, 
of uh, heat. So that comes either from infrared camera, so uh, MCVT, or then delta S, measured by calorimetry. So we can collect it from the P loops. So that's this part in the P loops. It works also with more uh, funny materials, so that we take into account all the all the losses from hysteresis. So it, uh, I mean, it's, it's very neat in terms of experiments. And then we observed uh, in the in this paper, too cool to work, uh, that if we want electrochoric materials to be of interest, we need to uh, recover energy extrinsically. So something that we also uh, um, worked on um, at some point. Uh, but intrinsically, we can also see that. Uh, PST can be uh, very, um, very efficient, much more than we thought initially. Um, so by making this, uh, this calculation, so I will uh, go straight to the point, sorry about that. So it goes too fast, but here we measured then the, the Delta T adiabatic and then deduced the heat generated at the same time. So we measure the charge uh, and then the energy needed to charge then this capacitor. So there's a peak in charge. Uh, so meaning that we can deduce this eta mat, so this efficiency, so the heat divided by the work. And we can see a peak also in PST that is extremely high, so 120, much more than we thought initially, as I, as I mentioned, which makes this material interesting also without any energy recovery. And on the top of that, we can recycle electrical energy. So that's something specific to, to electrocalorics. When we can use a trick from, from uh, electrical engineers, when imagine here you have two capacitors and you can bounce the energy from one capacitor to another one, which means that you can use, reuse the energy that you had on one capacitor. So this is what we did uh, some years ago with, with Cambridge as well. So when we were using uh, what we call the slapping machine, so I will just show it this way. So the idea is to cool down this small part here that we call a load uh, by slapping uh, alternatively and cooling down each time a bit further. So let me show you the video, which is uh, probably more uh, self-explaining. So you can see here the two pieces coming alternatively on the load and the load is becoming bluer and bluer, meaning that its temperature cools down. And on the top of that, so we used an extra um, device, so an electronic device. So here, this is to express then the, the decrease in temperature, which is much less than with PST, but still substantial. And we could see it with infrared camera. Uh, and then we could then implement these uh, with this, this uh, little circuit I just showed before uh, to show, so I mean, it kind of, looks complicated, but here, this is no energy recovery on the left. On the right, it's with energy recovery with the, the same graph, essentially the same graph of, of a decrease in temperature, but the difference is the COP. So that's only this line here that represents the work you need to trigger all these uh, heat, which is much lower in the case we, we recover energy or at, as we, we were hoping. And we could see that uh, we could increase the coefficient of performance of this device by a factor of three, thanks to this uh, specific uh, behavior of uh, of uh, electrochoric material. Um, I just finished the conclusion. I see uh, Donald telling me that we have to stop. Uh, large electrochoric effect means large variation of polarization and low dielectric constant. PST is probably the best electrochoric material. PVDF has to be followed. Uh, interesting uh, negative uh, feature in uh, PZ though, the field induced phase transition are extremely interesting. And this is something uh, that we have to study if we want to do a good job. Multi-layer capacitors, excellent structure for devices, the best prototype ever, uh, 13 degrees of uh, delta T, and then efficiency matters very much, intrinsic and extrinsic. And I also acknowledge uh, my colleagues from, uh, especially, I mean, from LIST, from Murata, UNIST, uh, uh, University in Cambridge, and also from uh, ICN2. And I thank you for your attention. So that was great. Let me see if I can figure out how to get us all on the screen here. Um, everybody. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we're okay. Can everybody see everybody now? Uh, Jorge, you can turn your uh, camera on and, and even unmute yourself if you'd like. Uh, so thank you so much. That was fantastic. I, we have time for uh, questions, and uh, uh, people can type them in in the uh, Q and A, and we can uh, even uh, um, possibly uh, 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 make you uh, uh, audible. And you can also uh, raise your hand uh, if you have a, uh, a question. Um, let me start with the first question. So so so. Uh, 
So uh, being characterized in terms of delta t. So I, I was wondering if you were to, th if one was to think in terms of the amount of heat one could transport. You know, right now as the as the uh, target call it whatever is cooling, or it's it, maybe it's getting out of the optimal temperature range. Uh, so if you if you uh, in other words, if you had a heater in that region instead of or something that was uh, keeping the temperature constant, and you were just seeing trying to see how fast you could how you how fast you could uh, uh, transport heat away, would that be uh, something that uh, I guess you could put a number on it maybe for a given device, but uh, but uh, I mean. We think of delta T because of the, the gas, uh, you know, refrigerators uh, that cycle, you know, at two temperatures. But, but, but maybe like uh, an application. You didn't talk so much about particular applications, but like if you were to have an app, a different kind of application, not to cool your food in a refrigerator, but maybe to cool a chip that's in a computer, uh, you know, then maybe you want something that just is constantly pumping heat away, and it's not so much cooling it; it's just removing the heat that's being generated. Is that is is that give any different uh, um, design criteria or or targets? Absolutely. So this is a well. I mean, in the 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 paper we we published last year uh, on the prototype. So we had a, another part on it that was mostly for the moment uh, um, on on simulation, but where we we try to answer this question. So trying to. Uh, to give a number one uh, on on what we call cooling power. So because you're right, uh, I mean only the delta t is is not interesting enough. So you want the power eventually. You need both. And then we we observe that uh, I mean we could figure out a, a number, uh, which is not uh, extremely impressive, but uh, well not not too bad. So it, it's in the, the region of watt per gram of material. Uh, but what we observed is that if we could implement eventually all the changes uh, needed uh, that, that are reasonable, so meaning getting thinner plates uh, and uh, using uh, water, for instance, uh, to exchange heat. So we could reach something which is close to one kilowatt per kilograms of material, which is typically what we would need for a fridge. So that's uh, not far-fetched, I would say. So it, it, it looks very reasonable. Still a lot of work to do, but that's, that's basically it. Mm -hmm. uh, Daryl has a couple questions. I, 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 uh, I can let you actually ask them, Daryl Schlom, if, if you want to unmute yourself. Sure. <clears throat> thanks, thanks, Ron. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so I have two questions. <clears throat> First, you showed this interesting curve comparing bulk to the multilayer capacitor. And yes. I saw the temperature range over which the multilayer capacitor worked was much broader. Why yes. is why is that? Because because of this um, super critical regime that we have, so we we drive the material like crazy compared to to bulk. So in bulk we can't do that because we reach uh, uh, the breakdown first. Okay. So but that's not the case. So that's somehow the interest of this uh, structure that you are in a kind of thin film regime, and we all know that you can apply much higher electric field. So that's why. Okay, and then the second question is: I'm wondering if. Um, improper ferroelectrics might have an advantage because of their low dielectric constant or, or maybe the p square is going to is, is dominates <clears throat> go ahead yeah so there, there was a paper published some years ago where they they were exactly uh, pointing the, these out and uh, because obviously i mean the, i didn't come up with the with the landon theory uh, um, i mean it was the first time that people uh, spotted these and then uh, yes that that's something that is definitely of interest but the, yeah, the trick is that you really need to get high polarization and at the same time, low direct constant. And for the moment, uh, well, I'm, obviously I'm not aware of everything, but PST is to me a very peculiar on this. Okay, great. Great, thank you. So, so uh, uh, Jorge or, or uh, Laurent, do you, do you want to, uh, I, I have a bunch of questions here. Do you, do you want to uh, jump in though and say anything or, or uh, uh, ask anything? Yeah, I mean, that, that would be great. Uh, first, uh, <laughs> Emmanuel, uh, fantastic talk, really uh, super nice. And, and I have two probably short questions. So this is a relaxer, sometimes it's super crazy. So have you ever seen an experiment that you put the fields on the temperature goes high, you put the fields off, it goes down, but not by the same amount. 
So it's not symmetric. And, and, and number two uh, question is this MLC seems really super interesting and you can reach, as you say, very high fields. But so can you use them for energy storage as well? Um, so if, if first question, uh, yes, we, we can, I mean, somehow this is also a drawback of, uh, of the, the, the first order phase transition that are very steep. And then uh, it's, uh, well, can, especially on bulk PST, uh, it's, it can be difficult to find the right temperature when you can ensure that you have the same amount of positive delta T and negative delta T. So mm -hmm. I show it some, you know, at some point we could see that it, it, they were not uh, peaking uh, at the same temperature. Uh, so this is perfectly normal and, and I mean it's it's related to the to the the phase transition as well so uh, it can be an issue and it's true on on um, on regular uh, ferroelectric materials but it's true on, on real axles as well so th we can also see it for instance on PDDF uh, there are some compositions that are more relaxer and we can see also that we are not uh, always symmetrical um, uh, then the the, um, the other question oh, sorry Laurent uh, the question is for the MLC. So since you can use a very high field, can you use it for energy storage? Ah, for energy storage. Uh, so, well, I mean, somehow MLCs are uh, initially, uh, have been initially uh, developed for this purpose. So this is, they are used for uh, as what we call decoupling capacitors. So that they are produced, so, I mean, this is really hundreds of billions that are produced every year made of barium titanate. And, uh, and they are already really good at, at, um, at keeping a large amount of, uh, of, of energy. Uh, but if you, if you look at the, the um, let's say the intrinsic properties of the materials, there are probably uh, materials that are much better at doing this. If we could you know, get something which is, which is uh, uh, as handy as, as a barium titanate in, in MLCs because the technology is well in place. But for instance, I mean, the, the, the famous uh, Hafnia, uh, could be could be much better can can uh, because the field can be higher you know so that that's uh, so the answer is yes thank you very much yeah. we have a few more questions from from the uh, attendees uh, just uh, very quickly because we're going to have to wrap up uh, uh, can you say something from uh, from from uh, Danilo Amoroso about uh, the reason you chose uh, PST and PZO um, as your materials? Well, I mean, we, we, we've been chasing uh, different materials uh, during the, those last 10 years, I would say, uh, well, especially with, with Neil uh, from Cambridge, and they just uh, came up that PST is, is extremely uh, uh, peculiar, uh, as I mentioned. So it's very close to room temperature. The variation is high compared to, uh, to others. Barium titanate is also a, a great choice, but the variation is smaller. Uh, and then you have to work uh, around 100 degrees, so it's not that handy. And on the top of that, it's also a bit opportunistic, I would say, uh, in the sense that um, we are working with, with extremely good materials so, uh, that, were, that are made in Korea for bulk uh, by Hukjo and in, in Murata in Japan um, with uh, Sakyo Hirose. Uh, so that's also you know, working with great materials. And PS, BZO is also somehow the same because I think it's very specific because we have access to a, a great anti ferroelectric material. Uh, somehow this is a prototypical material and, and working with, with Gustavo Catalan on this also uh, was, was a great opportunity. Great, great, great. I wanna uh, uh, just uh, thank you again and, and make some final comments for the next, uh, the rest of the series. And there's a number of people that have asked questions that we didn't have time to answer. I will uh, hopefully be able to make a copy of those and email those to you and then you can, okay. yeah, I think that'll work. I, I actually, this is our first one, so I'm not sure exactly how that works. But <laughs> I, I hope that that will be possible. So let me, uh, let me try to share uh, my, uh, my uh, summary here. By the, by the way, um, if, if you uh, uh, wanna uh, read more about, uh, um, about uh, these devices, you can look at this uh, uh, science paper from 2020, uh, by Manuel et al. On, uh, on exactly how this was done. It's a very interesting paper. So thank you again. I'm gonna just make a uh, comment about the, the, the rest of the series. Uh, uh, we're gonna do this uh, on the second, generally, this is the thir third Thursday this month, but generally it'll be on the second Thursday of uh, each month at 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. And uh, the next one will be May 13th by David Mueller from Cornell. 
on uh, new ways to see polar and multipolar order at the atomic scale. And there'll be an uh, email with a registration link again for that. By the way, we had uh, uh, over uh, 180 uh, uh, attendees today. So, uh, so um, it looks like the community you know, appreciates being able to hear these great talks. So that's great. And then Cyrus Dreyer on June 10th, non-adiabetic born effective charges and metals in the Drude weight, and Dennis Meyer on improper for electrics for sustainable nanotechnology on July 8th. And we have, we have talks lined up uh, going into uh, the fall even. And so uh, we'll just keep doing this as long as uh, people are interested. So thank you all. It's, I think it's time to sign off. People probably have other meetings to go to. So thank you. And we're gonna close the meeting now. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.